Hello and welcome to Journey of the Drop, Leadership and Responsibility, a programme from the World Petroleum Council and ITN Productions. I'm Natasha Kaplinski. It's the WPC's aim that oil and gas companies work responsibly to provide the necessary energy for all, create jobs and conscientiously tackle environmental issues. In this programme, we're going to be looking at how the industry and its leaders can continue to take their commitments seriously. Coming up. Setting the standard, the people leading the way in leadership and responsibility. Eastern Promise behind the scenes at the WPC's council meeting in Kazakhstan. Cooking on gas, providing clean energy to millions and gender diversity, attracting more women into the oil and gas industry. Well, I'm joined now by Dr. Piers Riemer, Director General, and Ulrika von Lonsky, the Director of Communications of the World Petroleum Council. Thank you both very much indeed for coming in. Um, great to talk to you. Piers, let's start with you. If you could maybe outline the key objectives of WPC, what it's all about. Well, our objectives today are the same as when the organisation was formed in the 1930s, which is to promote the sustainable use of oil and gas for the benefit of all. And we do that under the direction of our 70 member countries that represent over 97% of the world's oil and gas production and consumption. Fantastic. A busy man, clearly. Ulrika, um, one of the themes of this programme is all about leadership and responsibility. How does that fit with the organisation in general? Well, as Piers was saying, responsible operations is one of our key mottos. And it's something that we enhance uh, within the oil and gas industry. So we bring together those members of the oil and gas industry that have particularly good examples of technology or social uh, improvements and are willing to share that with other members. So we've created the World Petroleum Congress Leadership Conference, which happens every three years. And what we do is we'll have best practice examples and practical um, case studies to help others um, raise their standards across the industry, particularly in the areas of reducing energy um, emissions, in addressing the, the issues of climate change and uh, uh, providing sustainable solutions. There's going to be a lot to talk about at that Congress, isn't there, Piers? Energy poverty internationally is a big issue, isn't it? What do you do to address that? We work with some really scary numbers in that there are over two billion people that have no access to, to clean energy. In India, they're bringing over 10 million people a year out of energy poverty. But at the same time, because of the way that world population is increasing, it's still flatlining on the number of people in India that are still burning with dirty fuels, the worst kind of biomass that people can, people can burn. People often just say about this, it's a, it's a problem and it's, it's not very nice and then forget about it. And we felt that it's worth sort of quantifying what the real problem is. And so we, we had a team go to look at uh, the huts where people are burning these, these fuels. I say huts, these are people's homes. But they are, they are working and cooking in an environment which is the equivalent of smoking 400 cigarettes an hour. So it's a horrendous environment that they are living in. We're working with other organisations. The, the main one we're working with at the moment is OFID, the OPEC Fund of, for International Development. And we are, we are promoting via an energy access platform everything that industry is doing that is good around the world to bring people out of energy poverty. And finally, Piers, to pick up one of the themes of the programme, um, how are you working as an organisation to create the leaders of tomorrow? Well, that's a very interesting question because most of our national committees are people that look like me, who have grey in or, or no, no hair. So we want to encourage all the new people to, to come along. We've set up within our 70 member countries young professionals committees. They organise many activities throughout the year in different parts of the world in the different regions where we're, where we're working. And we also have a WPC Youth Forum where we'll bring nearly 2,000 young professionals from around the world together to discuss all the topics that, that keep them awake at night and in their, their part of the industry. 
Well, the other area that's obviously important to us as well is diversity. And in diversity, we're looking specifically at uh, engaging more women in the oil and gas sector. There are currently only 22% of the employees uh, are female. So um, we're very much encouraging companies to look at uh, what needs to change. And that definitely needs to be uh, coming from the top. So it does take CEOs and, and leadership involvement. But I think we can, we can benefit from their skills, their, um, their special um, views, and uh, the perspectives that they bring to the table as well. So we've done a big study around that, and it's, uh, it's an area that we will follow up uh, over the coming years. Well, we wish you the best of luck with that. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. The journey of the drop is a long one and one that won't be rushed. It takes millions of years to create the fuel that many of us take for granted in our daily lives. By the time the drop has reached the barrel, it's come a long way. Billions of years ago, the Earth's oceans teemed with marine life. When these small organisms sank to the sea floor, the lack of oxygen transformed them into an organic compound called kerogen. Time, pressure and extreme temperatures then reform this collection of carbon and hydrogen atoms into a drop of oil. As we follow that drop on its journey, it joins trillions of others, forming vast reservoirs beneath the Earth's surface, encased by rock and awaiting discovery. Mankind began seeking out that drop more than a century ago. And today, some of the planet's brightest minds and most advanced technologies are searching for that drop. Scanning oceans, deserts and everywhere in between. Whether the drop exists in a conventional or non-conventional deposit, increasingly efficient extraction techniques are employed to bring it to the surface. There, the drop is refined into petroleum products. They allow that drop to power our factories, build our streets, fashion our clothes, develop our fertilizers, our medicines, our electronics, and all of our plastic goods. It fuels the cars we drive, the trains we take, the ships we use, the planes we fly. The drop heats our water, it cooks our meals, it lights our homes. And so a drop that's derived from ancient life plays an integral part in our modern lives. The World's Petroleum Council's governing body meets once a year. The council meeting is a chance for the representatives of national committees from around the world to come together and discuss the organisation's activities and policies. The 2018 event took place in Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan, from where Ivor Bennett sent this report. Kazakhstan and its capital Astana was the venue for the 2018 meeting of the World Petroleum Council's governing body, a global network of stakeholders coming together to discuss a global issue, the sustainable use of energy for all. The main objective is to create uh, a, a sustainable development of the, of the industry. Uh, contributing to the development of the society. So it's uh, contributing to, to sustainable development for all, in a way. The WPC, as it's known, was set up in 1933 and is now made up of nearly 70 countries, ranging from China and Colombia to Venezuela and Vietnam. Between them, the members represent over 96% of the world's production and consumption of oil and gas. It's special because we are neutral and non-political, which means we can get quite a few countries together around the table talking about issues that perhaps normally they wouldn't. Whether it's learning from each other, exchanging new ideas or seeking new investment, the conversation moves quickly here. Each country represented by a national committee made up of voices from industry, academia and government. It is a great, great opportunity for everybody in the industry to get together and share experiences and collaborate. It's a nice way f to find the solutions for the energy challenges in our markets. In a rapidly changing world, the challenges are constantly evolving. How to meet rising demand while reducing the impact on the environment, all in an increasingly competitive market. We have to understand that uh, 
citizens are demanding good energy for them and we have to deliver. Of course, uh, the oil and gas industry is considered part of this problem, but we will be part of the solution more than any other uh, player. The solutions come from within the WPC family, which extends far beyond those gathered in Astana. Every three years, more than 10,000 participants gather for the WPC Congress, known as the Olympics of the petroleum industry. From technological advances in upstream and downstream to its social, economic and environmental impact, all aspects of the industry are discussed, with Houston hosting the next Congress in 2020. We haven't hosted it for over 30 years. All the technical innovation that's now taking place in the U.S., we want to share that information as well as welcome the world to come join us to uh, celebrate uh, the rebound in energy. Perhaps the biggest challenge the industry faces, though, is how to engage the next generation, as they will be its future. That's why WPC has set up its Young Professionals Committee, a platform to hear the voices of tomorrow as well as the fresh ideas they bring. There's a lot of technical, logical advances um, that come up, so it's really great to engage young professionals in this industry because they have a lot of great ideas to bring. This is a way to learn from peers, but also to talk about new topics, new challenges, such as climate change, renewables, digitalization of the industry. We are like a bridge, like a channel between the international arena, bringing all we know, all we gain from the professionals to the local content development. A diversity of perspectives is only achieved through a diversity of voices, which WPC creates through a membership that transcends age, gender and nationality. We wanted to make sure that this industry is inclusive of, of everyone. It doesn't just benefit one group of people, so we wanted to make sure that everyone who plays a part in it um, feels like they are included and part of the progress, part of the discussions about the challenges and part of the rewards as well. As a registered charity, WPC invests the proceeds from its events back into the country where they were held. The educational projects it's funded have benefited thousands of students around the world, a lasting legacy that embodies WPC's ultimate goal of a sustainable energy future. Every three years, the WPC organises the World Petroleum Congress, bringing together industry leaders, experts and stakeholders from around the globe. In 2017, the oil and gas sector met in Istanbul for the 22nd World Petroleum Congress. Vanessa Cutterford reports. Welcome to Istanbul and the 22nd World Petroleum Congress, where thousands of delegates and visitors gathered for the Olympics of the oil and gas world. This is where discussions are had and decisions are made about securing sustainable energy supplies for the future. It's a very important conference. It provides us an opportunity to get together in, in a wonderful city of, of Istanbul, but more importantly, on a regular basis, uh, the leaders of the world oil and gas industry get together and talk about the things that are relevant to us today and the things that are challenging to us as we go out into the future. So the conference format is tremendous. Uh, small sessions, uh, very well structured, uh, and you're seeing people are coming here and being very comfortable having conversations uh, almost in a, in a setting of friendship. WPC's member countries account for 96% of gas and oil consumption and production around the world. These plenary sessions and breakout discussions are vital for sharing high-level knowledge. I was overwhelmed when I came, not only in terms of the numbers I found here, but in terms of the topics that are being discussed and issues, and I've been exposed to new ideas. I have attended sessions uh, and realized there are a lot of quite new information, things I can take back to my country to improve our processes, to improve our operations. This youth lounge area is particularly useful for younger entrants to the oil and gas industry. These areas showcase a database of social responsibility projects by oil and gas companies around the world. We want all the students and young professionals representing the Congress to come here and know each other so they can create a real network and they can know people worldwide in the oil and gas industry. And also we develop some specific activities to broaden their, um, their career, like finding my CV or some mentoring activities on uh, how can develop, uh, they can develop their career. Istanbul and Turkey sit at a crossroads of vital energy supply routes. 
the perfect setting for the 22nd WPC conference theme of building bridges to secure our energy future. The 23rd Congress will be in Houston, Texas, and it'll come at a fascinating time. It will be interesting to see how the topics and issues that they have been discussing here in Istanbul, how they develop through these three and a half years, and, uh, and how the world also develop into handling those uh, issues. There is issues related to, to cost and resilience of the cost picture that we have established now. There are issues related to climate change, the Paris Declaration, and how we deal with that. Uh, the issues related to the energy mix and the role of oil and gas in the future. And it's, it's also issues related to, to, to energy for all. As the 22nd WPC conference and performance came to a close, Istanbul handed the mantle to Houston. A city whose economy is based primarily on the energy industry. Visitors to the 23rd World Petroleum Congress can expect a very Texan welcome when they meet once more to grapple with global challenges. Inspiring responsibility in the leaders of tomorrow is something that is high on many companies' agendas. The Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, or IOM3, hopes that the work they do now in inspiring and educating minds of all ages about sustainability will impact the future in a positive way. We went to find out more about the Institute's work. Port Talbot in South Wales is home to one of the largest integrated steelworks in Europe. Its owner, Tata Steel, has been a key contributor to the UK energy industries for more than 25 years and has supplied more than 1 million tonnes of pipeline for oil and gas products in the North Sea. Oil is also used here for the manufacturing of steel in the hydraulic systems and for lubrication in various production processes. And it was at the steelworks that I met the new president of the Institutes of Materials, Minerals and Mining, also known as IOM3. It's a professional body that promotes all aspects of materials science and engineering. IOM3 is a major engineering institution which is based in the UK but serves population worldwide and uh, our activities encompass the whole materials cycle to so everything from uh, exploration and extraction right through to materials recycling and land reuse. So we serve industries including the petroleum engineering, um, oil and gas and also the steel industry. So what does the institute do to support its members? One of the main ways that we can do this is we're an awarding body for professional qualifications. So this means that we can uh, help people with career development and also um, they get better recognition for the, the work that they're doing. The Institute is also keen to influence industrial and public policy debate as well as support emerging technologies. And it recognises the global importance of the transition to a low carbon resource efficient economy. Here at the Steelworks, steel is infinitely recyclable, so sustainability is at the very heart of what they do. There's a number of byproducts from the blast furnace process. The slag that we'll granulate, which will go into the cement industry, uh, and that helps reduce energy costs and CO2. And then the gases, which we re reuse on site for either heat or steam or electricity generation. Uh, and, and, and we're continually looking at improving those efficiencies and our, our next step on that is to move from combusting those gases to using chemical processes on those gases to produce products such as ethanol and methanol. IOM3 is also keen to support its members by delivering knowledge, information and networking services. Amy Goodall works for Tata Steel and is on the Institute's Younger Members Committee. It's helped build up a support network and links within the industry, which I wouldn't have had otherwise. Things like Materials World magazine has been really useful. It tells me not just what's going on in my industry, but what's going on in the general material science world as a whole, which has been great. I'm on the Younger Members Committee and that's for people early on in their career and it's a network for them. IOM3 has a membership of more than 18,000, members from a variety of backgrounds, from students right through to company chief executives. And another important part of the Institute's work 
is to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. All of those materials come from natural resources. And outreach activities by IOM3 in schools and colleges like this one in Swansea give young people a hands-on introduction to how materials shape the world around them. It was really interesting to see the different materials. My brother works in this line of work and here in the lesson today I know a little bit about it now. I was already going down the path of analytical sciences and analytical chemistry, but um, thinking about it now, I'm kind of interested in getting to the engineering aspect of things too. Once you have a group in front of you, it's not challenging to get them enthused at all. And seeing the looks on their faces change from, well, actually, I don't know very much about this, to, oh, wow, this is amazing, is incredibly rewarding. But also then to increase their aspirations and try and encourage them to think about going off into a materials field. In 2019, IOM3 celebrates 150 years since the formation of the Iron and Steel Institute. But as it looks to the future, it remains committed to serving a much wider range of industries, including oil and gas, as well as the people who work within them. Women account for around one-fifth of the workforce across the oil and gas sector, with an even smaller fraction working in technical posts. Attracting and retaining the female workforce also poses many challenges, but WPC believes that greater gender diversity is an attainable goal. So how can oil and gas companies tap into this critical pool of talent and potential to find its leaders? Robin Ross reports. The oil and gas industry still has a macho image, men in the oil fields. But with half the population of the world women, companies are missing out on an untapped reserve. A new report by the World Petroleum Council and the Boston Consulting Group shows men still dominate, with just one in five employees a woman. And out of those one in five women, most work in administration roles rather than technical. Women feel that they're not given the same access to job opportunities in the industry. Secondly, they feel that they don't get the same support from senior management as men do. And thirdly, there's also an element of not feeling confident enough to ask for those positions. Researchers spoke to 2,000 male and female employees, carried out 60 face-to-face -face interviews with senior executives and gathered data from 38 companies. They discovered as time goes by, many women fall off the career ladder. The big drop is between middle management and top level positions where the percentage drops from 25 to 17 percent. It's perhaps because the career progression isn't equal and hasn't been equal for a while. So a lot of the women probably haven't got the field experience or perhaps some of the technical experience that some of the male colleagues have had. And also I think it's, it's often seen as a, a sort of an old boys club or a men's club and they perhaps don't get the sponsorship that other people do to get to the top. Uh, next time you have an opening for a job, very interesting job, career supporting job, somewhere out in Angola or Nigeria, Kazakhstan, Alaska, please ask the talented women on your team as well if they would want to take it and don't assume that they won't. Great female role models do exist and CEOs are key to changing the perception of women. If a CEO doesn't care about gender diversity, then only a third of men think it's important. But if the CEO does care, then 86% of men care too. Women can be less risk-taking, often better, better at team working. You get a diversity of, of ideas. And as my wife tells me, women are better moderators as well. The goal is to increase the number of women in the industry to 35% over the next five years at all levels. Members of WPC are already doing more to keep and attract women. The CEO of Saudi Aramco has written to everybody in the company to encourage them to involve more women and promote more women. Uh, in Hungary, MOL are financially supporting female graduates to university. In the United States, Exxon are having engineering days to attract, to attract young girls into the industry. In Austria, OMV have their Technic Princess programme for 14 to 16 year olds. So we have many members doing lots of things in this area. The supply of oil is a hot topic, but what about the supply of talent? The WPC's Future Leaders Forum is bringing more women onto the stage, encouraging companies to include them in STEM programmes so they can take on the jobs of tomorrow. 
Obtaining gender balance is critical for the industry. And it is critical because there is a very high percentage of persons that are above 50 years old that are going to retire in the coming years. At government level, you need to encourage governments to promote science and technology more to, to young women at schools and get people really interested and keen on science at an early age. The research will continue and WPC will use it to help companies create more opportunities for women. Women actually are more flexible than men think. You just need to ask them. And on the other hand, uh, men are much more supportive than women think. You just need to ask them. In what's being seen as a model for other countries, India's mass distribution of clean fuels to communities is having a positive effect on lives. More than 15 million households across India are replacing biomass fuels that damage health and the environment during cooking with LPG. David Reed went to New Delhi to see how gas has made the difference. More smoke than heat. Pravesh is making tea, struggling to get the fire hot enough by puffing through a pipe onto a traditional fuel common in many Indian households. The atmosphere in the house stings your eyes and makes you choke. Particularly in rural areas, many households are continuing to use this solid fuel. The smoke it produces isn't good for the women who are cooking here, isn't good for anyone living in this household. It's why the Indian government is pushing for the uptake of a cleaner cooking fuel. Preparing this fuel is straightforward. They've been doing it the same way for centuries. Pervez makes a batch in no time and leaves them to harden in the sun. Once this mixture of dung and straw is made into a cake, it's then sort of loaded up and made into a structure with a shelter on top from the monsoon rain. And if you think about it, this ought to be the ultimate green technology or green fuel. It's cheap, locally available, and it does slowly heat your food. But the health hazards rule it out as a sustainable fuel. Enter liquid petroleum gas, just one of a number of clean fuel options that are making themselves at home in households across India's cities and countryside. The benefits of clean fuels like LPG go beyond alleviating the health damage of all that smoke. As delegates of this World Petroleum Council workshop in Delhi heard, replacing traditional fuels with alternatives that actually cook faster can also change the lives of the women traditionally tasked with doing all the cooking. If they move from a biofuel consumption to uh, using gas or pipe gas or even LPG for that matter, uh, they save about five to six hours. So they spend five to six hours because they have to collect biomass, they have to let it dry for a while, they have to keep it for drying, they have to monitor it all the time, and then cooking from biomass takes about three to four hours. And that gets reduced significantly. So in that time that they save, they can actually engage in much better economic activities. It's the sort of positive change that many want to see replicated across the developing world. The problem we have is that we have a world's population that is increasing. We will have a minimum of 9 billion people in, by, 20, by 2050. Could be 11 billion, depending on, on the numbers, and all those people would need energy. At the moment, we don't have enough energy for the people that are here. And we have an enormous number of people who are in energy poverty, they have no access to clean energy at all. 
And it's not just about access to clean and effective cooking fuel. Much of Delhi's pollution comes from cars and trucks driven on lower quality fuel than that used in Europe or the US. India's government is now setting deadlines for producing cleaner petrol for a new generation of drivers. India has an issue of energy access. So everybody doesn't have access to energy in India the way developed countries have, the way Europe has, the way US has. So what we are practically doing is somebody who doesn't have access to a transportation fuel, who doesn't have access to a car or a bike, he will start driving a car or a bike in 2020 with the cleanest fuel possible in the world. So that's the vision. So we are not trying to, so it's like something like the telecom revolution. We move directly from uh, no phone or no connectivity to mobile phone connectivity. So hopefully we can emulate the same uh, success story in uh, use of fuels, cooking and transportation fuels, we move directly from no fuels to the clean or cleanest fuels. All types of energy sources are needed to provide sustainable energy for everyone. In India, solar power is one of the country's fastest growing businesses, with nearly one million solar lanterns sold in 2015. It's successful here because in common with many developing countries, India gets plenty of sun, but also because clean solar is rapidly getting cheaper than traditional coal. You cannot be only providing clean energy if it is very expensive. It has to be affordable also. So the options which will be, uh, which will really see the light of the day in a country like India will be the clean but affordable energy. There is no single solution to fuel poverty. Renewables like solar electricity, better quality petrol for transport, clean LPG for cooking. All have roles to play across the world in addition to the traditional fuels. All are needed to deliver modern energy to the over 3 billion people still relying on solid fuels for cooking, while keeping the environment and families safe from harm. Thank you for watching Journey of the Drop, Leadership and Responsibility. We hope you've enjoyed the programme. All of our reports are available on the World Petroleum Council's website. The details are on the screen now. From me and the team here, thank you for watching. Goodbye.